live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Brian Mallow. Hello. Yay. Hello, everybody. It's Thursday night, and here at the museum, it's Science Thursday. And we are having our Science Cafe here in the Daily Planet Cafe of the Nature Research Center at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So thanks for being here. Um, we do this pretty much every Thursday or something like it. Next Thursday will be trivia night, so we hope to see some of you for that, science trivia night. Uh, but today's program, so we've been looking forward to this. Um, not all of our topics are extremely timely because we book them uh, months in advance sometimes, but we've been really looking forward to this one because, uh, and maybe you are too, you're here. I think I see some fresh faces. Is anyone here for the first time? Welcome. Uh, was it the topic that brought you out? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we've been looking forward to this for a long time because it's about a great human health issue, uh, the Zika virus, and uh, it's been problematic in other places, but it is here, right? It is here. And our guest is going to tell us uh, what we need to know about it, if we need to worry about it. And uh, our program will be about, about half an hour, and then the second half hour is Q&A. So we'll bring microphones around to you, and we'll count on you to, pro to make the second half of our program really interesting. So, let me introduce you to our guest. She is the Assistant Director of the North Carolina um, State Laboratory of Public Health. Yes. It's a mouthful, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen Dr. D. Pettit. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here with you all tonight and to tell you about the North Carolina State Lab of Public Health and to share with you some of our experiences in responding to the emergence of new threats such as Zika virus. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get used to this and <laughs> you'll bear with me. <laughs> so my objectives today are to introduce to you how we prepare for and respond to biological emergencies and these are really the emergence of novel pathogens. I'm going to describe to you arboviruses, how they have been and continue to be a threat. And I'm going to review West Nile virus, but also discuss the threat proposed by other arboviruses, such as dengue, chikungunya, and Zika virus. And lastly, I'm going to discuss the Zika virus outbreak in Brazil. I'm going to provide you with information about the clinical presentation of disease the unique transmission routes that we've identified, and also the challenges in identifying individuals that are infected with this virus. So first I'd like to tell you about the um, public health laboratories, and there are 11 core functions of public health laboratories, but for our discussion tonight, I'm just going to talk about the top four. And the top four are disease control and prevention, reference and specialized testing, and these are the tests that we use to identify these novel pathogens. We also do public health related research, so when something is new and novel and emerging, we try to identify all the information that we need to know in order to respond appropriately. And the fourth topic I'll discuss is emergency preparedness and response. So to have a, a rapid and effective response to an emerging pathogen, first we have to have the ability to detect it. And so in the case of Zika virus, it's an arbovirus, so we not only have to worry about the virus, but we also have to think about the environment and how the environment can sustain vectors or mosquitoes to allow for transmission to occur. We next have to analyze and characterize the environment. And this is really trying to identify where the mosquitoes can be and if viral transmission can occur to humans. 
And then lastly, we have to communicate and collaborate with several partners. And these include um, partners in public health, such as the Communicable Disease Branch, environmental sciences, healthcare workers, and other laboratorians. And these laboratorians um, that we collaborate with are all members of the Laboratory Response Network. And the Laboratory Response Network it can be shown as, in this diagram as a three-tiered pyramid. And um, these are all representing laboratory participants in the network, which include clinical diagnostic laboratories that you'd see in a hospital, public health laboratories, military, veterinary, agricultural, um, food testing, and environmental science laboratories. So in the base of the pyramid, what you see are sentinel or clinical diagnostic laboratories predominantly. In North Carolina, we have 125 sentinel laboratories and 85% of them are clinical labs. And we have an emergency courier, so these clinical labs can send specimens to the next level within the period very rapidly. So, oops. <laughs> So the second tier in the pyramid is reference laboratories. And your state public health laboratory is the only reference laboratory in this system within North Carolina. And we, um, as a reference laboratory, are responsible for timely and accurate detection and characterization of emerging threats. And then the top tier of the pyramid are the national laboratories, and there are three in the United States. They include the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, the U.S. Army Medical Research Center for Infectious Diseases, and the Naval Medical Research Center. Um, these agencies have the maximum containment facilities that often you'll see in the movies. And they have uniquely trained and vaccinated staff that support investigation of dangerous pathogens. And collaboratively, we work with all of these laboratory pa um, partners to improve and protect the health and well being of citizens. So, emerging infectious disease threats that we've responded to in North Carolina in our recent past include West Nile virus. Bacillus anthracis, and that's the causative agent of anthrax. We've um, also uh, provided testing for SARS, maybe many of you remember that, severe acute respiratory syndrome, influenza virus, which is the most well-known emerging infectious disease that is continually emerging. Um, we've provided testing for MERS-CoV, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. We responded to Ebola virus in the recent outbreak. We also provided testing for chikungunya virus, and now we're responding to the emergence of Zika virus. One of the things I want to point out from this slide is if you look at the list of agents here, what you'll notice is that 90% of them are viral agents. So typically when you have an emergence of an infectious disease, typically it is a virus. Secondly, 70% of these organisms are zoonotic. And that term, what it means is that they're diseases that are moving from animals into the human population. And the third thing I'd like to point out is 40% of the threats that currently exist are arboviral threats, and Zika is one of them. So there are many arboviruses that are circulating in the United States, but predominantly in North Carolina, we see four. And those include West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, Eastern equine encephalomyelitis virus, and La Crosse encephalitis virus. But tonight, we're really going to focus on the viruses in the flaviviral family. And those include West Nile, Dengue, Zika, and um, St. Louis encephalitis. And one of the things I want to point out about this family of viruses is they're all very closely related. And this can sometimes complicate our ability to detect a, um, 
a specific virus within that, that family. And so the word arbovirus is really used to describe a group of viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes, ticks, and other arthropods. And shown here on this diagram is the biological transmission cycle that we see with some arboviruses like West Nile, in which the virus is um, first entering into a transmission cycle by a mosquito taking a blood meal from an infected bird. And once they take this blood meal, they then acquire infection with the virus, and the virus multiplies within the mosquito, and then the next blood meal that they take, they can then transmit the pathogen to the next host, which can be a human. So this is an example of how an infectious disease can move from an animal population into the human population. And this is called zoonotic, a zoonotic disease. So with these arboviral infections, there are four factors that are essential for arboviral transmission. And this graph just depicts the importance of the four factors and how all of these factors need to align in order for transmission to occur. First, first and most importantly, we have to have the presence of the pathogen or the virus. Next we have to have a vector, a mosquito, to transmit the disease. Um, third, we have to have a host. And this is um, a human being, in the case of Zika virus, that is susceptible to infection. And lastly, we have to have an environment to support the vector and the host. And all four of these things have to align. And what we know about arboviruses is because all of these factors have to align, we have very focal transmission. And so during an outbreak, you'll see outbreaks being very focal. And I'd like to give you an example of this um, and represent some of the work that we did when we were addressing West Nile um, virus emergence. So this is a diagram, and the dots on this diagram represent dead birds that died of infection from West Nile virus. And so the dead birds were collected, sent to the laboratory, and were tested to determine they were infected. And we use that as a way to identify where the risk was of viral transmission. And so we wanted to overlay to see if this was a good predictor of where we would be seeing viral activity. And so if we overlay that with human infection, and now you should see the stars emerging representing human infection, it very closely aligned. So where you see the circulation of West Nile virus, you see human transmission. But if you look closely at this diagram and look in the left-hand corner, you'll see a star there. And there are no dead birds that are positive for West Nile virus next to that individual. And so this was a puzzle because we thought, well, we should be seeing dead birds if this individual became infected. And so a medical entomologist actually went out to the resident of this um, individual, trapped mosquitoes, no positive mosquitoes around the residents. So next, um, we had epidemiologists go and talk with the individual to try to identify what the risk factor was and how this individual acquired infection. And what we found out is that this individual actually worked right here. <laughs> and then the epidemiological investigation found, <laughs> identified the risk factor, and this individual would go out after work, have a few beers at a bar, would become intoxicated to the point that the individual didn't want to drive home, so they would spend their, the night in their car with the windows rolled down. So... Um, <laughs> So definitely all four factors are met here where we have the um, virus, we have the mosquito, we have an individual spending time outdoors unprotected, and so transmission occurred. So with chikungunya 
dengue and also Zika virus, the transmission cycle is slightly different. And here, the only host for infection is a human being. And so what's required is that a mosquito bites an infected human and then transmits the disease to another human. And this requires the um, virus to be sustained in the mosquito and then also sustained in the human to allow for further transmission to occur. So with Zika virus, what we know about the virus is it was first identified in 1947 in Uganda. And from 1947 to 2007, only 14 um, cases of human infection had been reported. So there were only sporadic instances of infection. In the year 2007, there was an outbreak in Yap in Micronesia, and there were 49 cases of Zika viral infection there. And the next largest outbreak that occurred was in 2013, and we had 20,000 cases in French Polynesia. And then our largest outbreak was in 2015 in Brazil, and we had 500,000 to 1.3 million people infected. So many of you may be thinking, well, what was so unique about Brazil? And you might be wondering, um, has the virus changed and now more people are becoming infected? But what we actually think is that Brazil was the perfect alignment of all of those factors that we've talked about to allow for a um, transmission to be very efficient um, in, in that environment. And so what we've learned about the outbreak in Brazil is that there are um, mosquitoes there, and many of you may be familiar with these tiger mosquitoes, but there is a mosquito called Aedes aegypti, and it is one of the most efficient vectors for the um, transmission of viruses to humans. And this is because the Aedes um, aegypti and Aedes albopicta both have a predilection for human blood. So they seek human, a human blood meal. And so this allows for very efficient um, transmission of viruses. And so in Brazil, many arboviruses are circulating. And that Aedes aegypti, which is the um, primary vector of transmission for Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya, um, we, all of these arboviruses um, in Brazil often present with similar, similar clinical features. And so individuals that are infected will present with a fever, a rash, um, joint pain, muscle pain, and headaches. But each of them have a unique clinical manifestation. And for Zika virus, the uniqueness is non-purulent conjunctivitis, or pink eye. Um, for dengue viruses, the uniqueness there is it's a hemorrhagic fever. And with chikungunya, and the name of the virus actually stands for break bone fever. And this means that individuals infected with this virus have arthritis, and it can be quite severe and last for up to a year. And just to show you and, and talk more about the clinical presentation of infection with Zika virus, approximately 20% of individuals that are infected will develop symptomatic illness. Clinical illness is usually mild and self-limiting and lasts typically two to seven days. And the picture to the right shows the typical maculopapular rash that you see in individuals infected with this virus. Um, severe disease requiring hospitalization is very rare and fatalities are even rarer. But what we have detected in a small population of infected individuals is the presentation of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And this is a neurological disorder that can result in temporary paralysis. So case management for um, Zika virus and other arboviruses illnesses 
often is supportive care. And this is because we ha really have no good therapeutic treatments for individuals that are infected. Um, so supportive care is telling the patient that they need to rest, need to drink lots of fluids, and also they can have um, analgesics and antipyretics to address fever and also pain that they experience from infection. Aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs should be in, um, avoided, and this is prior to the rule out of dengue virus because with hemorrhagic fever, this would be a complication. So because there are no therapeutics, we really need to focus on prevention. And this is, one, number one, establishing good public health infrastructure so messages can be conveyed to the community to limit time outdoors, to apply insecticides, and also to tell people to eliminate standing water. And in North Carolina, we're initiating our tip and toss campaign so that people can eliminate standing water in their home um, environment. Also, vector control is important, having insecticides and pesticides that can eliminate the mosquito larvae and the adult mosquitoes. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the outbreak in Brazil and something else that was uniquely identified in this environment. So during the outbreak in Brazil where we had up to a million individuals infected, it was noticed that there was a tenfold increase in microcephaly in babies. And this is a um, reduction in the circumference of the head of the infant. And with microcephaly, what occurs there is the brain does not develop properly. And this lack of development results in a reduced circumference of the head. And you can see the diagram shown here on the right. And babies that are born with microencephaly will experience seizures, developmental delays, intellectual disabilities, problems with movement and balance, um, difficulty swallowing, hearing loss, and they'll also have visual um, problems. And this um, slide just demonstrates um, an MRI which shows you both a normal brain and then a brain that's been compromised and um, is resulting in microcephaly. And because this was associated with the outbreak of Zika virus, we wanted to look at the neurological condition of stillborn babies to determine if the virus was actually present in the neural tissue. And what was initially determined in doing an analysis of the neural tissue is that there was classic presentation or pathology of a viral origin of infection. And so the next question was, well, is it Zika virus or is it other viruses that typically will result in microcephaly? And so what we did, once we developed a strategy to test for the virus, we could see the association. And further studies have shown that Zika virus has a very strong neurotropism, meaning it tracks to neural tissue, and it does this very well in the fetus. And um, the fetal brain and eyes have high concentration of virus. It was also no noted that other abnormalities in the brain occurred, and we see cranial calcification in the brain. Studies have demonstrated that Zika virus destroys neural structure and arrests the development of the cerebral cortex, and this is why we see the shrunken head. So with Zika virus, what we now know is that it can not only be transmitted by the bite of an infected mosquito, but a unique and novel transmission can occur in which a mother can transmit the infection to um, her fetus. And so this is very unusual for arboviruses. The other unusual route of transmission that we've seen is transmission through sexual contact. 
And this was really surprising to us as well. And the way this was identified is that males traveling into endemic region would acquire infection, present with clinical illness, travel home, and then the disease would be transmitted in the absence of mosquitoes to their sexual partner. And so this suggested sexual transmission and this has been explored and we know that there is a high level of viremia in semen. So sexual transmission can occur from a male to a female. Because we know that Zika virus infection occurs in the blood, we'll suspect that blood transfusions will also be compromised and organ transplantation, but this hasn't been reported to date. So next we want to assess our risk and to do that we have to determine if these four factors are present in North Carolina. And so what are the ways that we could acquire Zika virus infection and have the ability to transmit the disease within our own environment? So we have to think back about those four factors. Well one, we would have to have a human host that's infected come into North Carolina. And what we know is that approximately 2.8 million people from, travel from Brazil into the United States each year. And the other thing that we know is in 2016, the Summer Olympics are being hosted in Brazil. So we can expect to have many individuals traveling into the United States from Brazil this summer. So how do we prepare here in North Carolina for this emergence of infectious disease? Well, the first thing we do is to develop strategies to be able to detect the viral agent. And we can do this in two ways. The first way is to directly detect the virus, and this would be looking for nucleic acid associated with the virus, or we can culture um, specimens from humans and actually see the virus. Um, or we can look indirectly, and this is looking at the body's immune response to viral infection, and it can be specific to a virus. So we can look for an indirect um, means of identifying viral infection. And though this slide represents when we can use those strategies to detect Zika virus. So I told you that individuals that are symptomatic have symptoms for two to seven days. And so if we want to detect the presence of virus, this is the best time to do it. And we can actually detect virus in serum. Later stages, when a patient is convalescent and they are no longer presenting with symptoms, the method that we would choose to detect infection would be an immunodiagnostic. And so it would be looking for factors in your immune response. So looking at the production of antibodies that bind to the Zika virus and neutralize it. So in North Carolina at your public health laboratory, we've recently brought on board a CDC emergency use authorization assay to detect immunoglobulin that can bind to the Zika virus. So we've brought on board that um, indirect detection me mechanism. And we're currently in the process of verifying another CDC emergency use authorization um, trioplex assay, which allows us to detect not only Zika virus, but also chikungunya and dengue during the acute phase of infection. We've brought on chikungunya virus in our um, testing in our recent past, so we can cover that there. But now specimens are currently being forwarded for dengue testing to the CDC. And one of the things that's really challenging for us when we're using this immunodiagnostic is that the, immuno, the antibodies that are developed to Zika virus also can bind to dengue virus and other flaviviruses. So this really complicates how we can interpret results um, and to identify viral infections specifically resulting from Zika virus. 
So if we look back at the diagram and we want to further analyze and characterize the threat here in North Carolina, we want to ask the questions, is the pathogen here? Um, do we have a vector that supports transmission of the infectious disease? And are there hosts, are there individuals coming into North Carolina that have viremia that we can actually detect the virus being present in the individual? And lastly, do we have an environment that supports um, viral transmission and also the mosquito and the replication of the virus in the mosquito? So here are the answers to some of those questions. This graph depicts the distribution of Aedes um, aegypti, which is that primary vector that we see in Brazil that is very competent in transmitting Zika virus. And you could see that North Carolina is not colored in, so this is some good news. Right now, we think that there's a, either a very low or no prevalence of that mosquito here in North Carolina. But you may be thinking, but I've seen those tiger mosquitoes, so I think they are here. And actually, the species that is here is Aedes albopictus. And right now, we don't know if that mosquito is a really good vector for transmission of Zika virus. So currently, the Department of Health is in the process of recruiting two medical entomologists, and these individuals are going to do a more extensive surveillance to um, determine if Aedes, Aedes aegypti are actually here. So the next question you may have is, well, have cases been identified here in North Carolina? And you can see here, North Carolina is shaded in. So actually, we have identified infection in seven individuals that have traveled in South America and returned to North Carolina. And of those seven individuals, six of them allowed detection using an indirect method. And this is important. So we didn't see those individuals having viremia. However, one individual was viremic, and we were actually able to detect the presence of virus. So we do know that we've had an individual travel coming back into North Carolina, so we could potentially have a, um, autochthonous transmission or local transmission occurring. So this figure actually represents a recent publication in PLOS in which the scientists wanted to determine what, where are the risks and where could we potentially see viral transmission. And the shaded areas in this, um, in, in this um, picture represent areas that would be conducive for Aedes aegypti. And so you can see North Carolina has that shading in which we could have conditions that are conducive for this mosquito. The circles that you're seeing distributed on this map represent the volume of travelers coming in. And so high risk areas, you'd see more travelers coming from Brazil. And here you can see a large number going to New York and also a large number of travelers in Florida and then also in Texas. And so these are really considered to be the regions most at risk for transmission occurring. Uh, and so what I want to leave you with is certainly we have the um, possibility of transmission occurring here in North Carolina, but I think it's more unlikely than it is probable. And so how can we protect or reduce the likelihood of transmission? Well, certainly the risks to children and adults are fairly easy to address in terms of we can reduce the time that we spend outdoors, um, we can apply insecticides, and we can practice um, tip and toss, removing standing water um, within our environments. But it's much more challenging in situations reducing the risk to that unborn fetus. And so to reduce that risk, the CDC has developed guidelines for the use of safe sexual practices to avoid interuterine infection. 
And the recommendation is for women to postpone travel to endemic regions, for men and women to wait eight weeks post onset of illness before trying to conceive a child. Um, men should wait at least six months before having unprotected sex. And the six month time window, they've actually done studies and shown that viral persistence can continue for up to two months in seminal fluid. And so what they do is take that window of time, multiply it by three, because we really don't know how long it persists right now. And then asymptomatic men and women, we don't know if they can transmit um, Zika virus to an unborn fetus, but the recommendation is people who have traveled and, and are asymptomatic should wait um, eight weeks before conceiving. So with that, I'll end my presentation and hopefully you're eager to ask some questions that, that I can address. <laughs> How about a nice round of applause for Dr. D. Pettit? And uh, so the way we'll do this is uh, please raise your hand and maybe multiple times and get my attention and I'll bring a microphone around to you. I'll try to get to you in the order that uh, that you raised them, and um, while Dr. Pettit is answering one question, I'll be looking for people that are looking for me. I'll start us off with one. So <laughs> I've always been fascinated with viruses, and almost like a like the ultimate David and Goliath, the fact that a, a virus can kill something that much bigger than it, like a human, and when we outweigh it, and we have a height advantage of like trillions, <laughs> that it's amazing that a virus can kill it. How does the Zika virus uh, hurt us and kill us? How, how does it, how does it, it do It rarely, that? rarely kills people. It rarely kills. <laughs> so and it, um, Zika viral infection is very mild. And so, and only 20% present with illness. So 80% of people that are infected don't even know that they've been infected with a virus. So then the, the birth of a, the, the, the worst effect then the worst is that, so how does that happen? How does, how does my infection or the mother's infection result in that microcephaly? Uh, well, Do we know that? Well, <laughs> we can make really good guesses yeah. and we're just learning about that now. But um, Zika virus is really unusual. It, really is unprecedented in terms of arboviral transmission to an unborn fetus. Um, this does not typically occur. And so this was really a novel finding. Um, what we know is that the virus can move through the placenta and it has a neurotropism, which means that it goes into the neural tissue of the fetus and that's where it likes to be and it actually starts destroying the neural tissue within the fetus and resulting in the microcephaly. I, um, I have two questions. Number one, um, if you announce that you have Zika virus in this state and it's spreading, it's gonna have a disastrous effect on the economy. Are you as an agency under pressure politically to avoid that? I know that's, you could lie about that, but I'm assuming you're not. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, I would like to think that um, we would never lie in public health because our ultimate goal is to protect people. And one way that we can protect people is by making them aware of the threat. And then they can make a decision, I'm going to stay indoors, I'm going to apply insect repellent, I'm going to use tip and toss, I'm going to call Mosquito Joe because I don't want mosquitoes in my yard. So having an educated community is what we're about. So I don't think we would ever hide that fact. I think that it would be very rare to have Zika transmission and what we call autochthonous transmission is where it locally is transmitted by a mosquito. I think that that's really unlikely here in North Carolina. And you know, many of you may remember West Nile virus and it's spreading all over. Well, because it, it only moves Zika virus from human to human, and we are really fortunate in that probably everyone here in this room has air conditioning. 
So we don't spend time out in the environment at night and get mosquito bites. So we spend most of our time in air-conditioned environment. And so you're not going to be at risk there. So I think that we have a lot of things in place here that would prevent a massive outbreak from occurring. Well, okay. The other part of this is should be short, I hope. Uh, do we develop a lifetime immunity or do we get it immunity for six months? We don't know. <laughs> we really don't know at this point because we've learned so much from the Brazilian outbreak just because of the size of the outbreak. And so there are a lot of things we don't know. What we do know is that the antibodies that we develop to Zika virus also react with dengue virus and vice versa. So, um, and <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, a little bit of a good thing there. But the bad thing about that is with dengue virus, there are several different strains. And the m more strains that you become infected with, the more ramped up your immune system is. And then that response that kills the virus can have a deleterious effect to the person. So the, the more antibody response you have can make you more compromised. Dr. Pettit. Thank you. <laughs> uh, two, two questions. The first one is, uh, has it been determined yet if the Zika virus would have some future uh, ramifications to a person, for example, like ch uh, chicken pox and shingles? And the other question is, how was it named? Um, so, okay, first part, chingles, shingles. Um, we don't know because all of the information that we have is really based on sporadic outbreaks. So we're still in that learning curve. And we've learned a lot from the Brazilian outbreak and even the microcephaly and the Guillain-Barre syndrome that was identified during this Brazilian outbreak. They went back to past outbreaks and said, was this occurring in the past ones or is this something new? And retrospectively, they actually could confirm in past outbreaks there was an increase in microcephaly that corresponded to the outbreak. So um, what is in store for us, we really don't know because we're really in a new situa new novel situation. And then your other question. <laughs> name. Oh, yeah. Where did the name oh, come from? Um, it it came from the region that um, the case was first identified in Uganda. It was identified in the Zika region. And so it's actually from where it was first identified. Is that viruses, we always hear about that with some of these types of viruses, of the jumping from one animal, a bird, a monkey, and then jumping to humans. So at first, the virus is very specific. It only affects this bird or this monkey, and then something, it adapts or it, it, it mutates and it's able, is that a, I don't know, is there something you can, I'm not exactly sure what my question is, but <laughs> about how weird that is. Like, I'm not sure either. Because so. <laughs> some viruses, many viruses are, are specific to whatever species they're specific to, and then sometimes these viruses hop species. So, like how, so viruses, how yeah, that's a, that's a strange thing, right? Because well, um, maybe you will recall in my presentation, I was showing that these emerging pathogens, you know, many of them, 90% of them are going to be viruses. And there's something very interesting about viruses, and it, um, the nucleic acid structure in virus can be RNA or DNA. Well, RNA viruses, because they have to code through reverse transcription to make DNA, it can be error prone. And so often that's a way that the viruses can change. So many of the emerging pathogens are RNA viruses and they do have um, spontaneous changes that can then allow them to move from one species to another where they normally hadn't. Um, several of the zoonotic diseases, it's just that you have this perfect alignment you know, where you have an animal reservoir and then a vector that can transmit from that animal reservoir into humans. And so there are lots of reasons why that can um, 
occur over time. Deforestation, bringing humans closer to animals, and they weren't close to them in previous times. But um, also travel, international travel, moving um, agriculture and animals to places that they hadn't been previously. So there are lots of factors that can contribute to the emergence. This is not the first time that I've heard that one of the recommendations for preventing the spread of Zika is to um, be careful about going outdoors or to stay indoors more or at certain times. And I, I'm sure there's really good reason for that, but it seems especially sad and ironic to be saying that in a science museum where we're spending tons of time trying to wrest children away from their digital devices and get them outdoors. So do you see this as being a sort of a stopgap or temporary solution to the problem until some better means of preventing transmission comes along, or, or are we really going to be sequestered in the future in our air-conditioned houses all the time and our kids going to be afraid to go outdoors? Well. Um, your question just brings to mind risk assessment. And the reason I say this is because if you think of Zika virus, and a person my age, I'm not in the childbearing, thank, thankfully. <laughs> I have four, that's enough. Um, but, you know, for me to acquire Zika virus infection, it's self-limiting, two to seven days. Am I really worried about that? And for me, no. If I'm a woman in childbearing, age, I am worried about that. So I think that you have to do your own risk assessment. And if you want to spend time outdoors responsibly, what you could do, wear long sleeves, pants, um, apply insecticide. Um, there are ways that you can prevent infection responsibly. But I think you have to think about the risk assessment too. Um, I had a comment and then I, I had another um question for you, but it was in response to something you had said about the, oh, everybody has central air. No, they don't. I live two miles from here, two and a half miles from here downtown and in these older houses. I don't need central air. I'm surrounded by forests. It's very cool. I live near a riparian area. There's tons of mosquitoes. I get bit every summer all the time and I don't have central air. And a lot of the poor folks um, downtown do not have um, poor air, so there might be some inequality there. Just go throwing that out there. The, the other thing is, is um, I was listening to NPR and they had uh, a CDC person from the federal government saying, Zika is already in Puerto Rico. A lot of Puerto Rican friends. Has there been outreach to the Latino community, in particular the in, in Puerto Rico? We may not be able to get the Egypti type of that, but if, you know, there's a lot of traveling back and forth um, between Puerto Rico and here. I know my stepsister loves the vacation there um, and, and other people from Florida as well. I mean, my dad's a snowbird, so I know a ton of people f that used to live in Florida have family. Um, what are we doing to outreach to those people uh, as a state? Um, well, certainly you bring up a really good point, and I really focused on the outbreak in Brazil, but there are many um, places in which there is autochthonous transmission occurring, and there have been, I, I believe the last count was 283 autochthonous transmissions within Puerto Rico. So certainly we know that they have the mosquitoes there. We're seeing the transmission um, there. And I know that there is a lot of work being done to detect the presence of virus. Actually, um, Puerto Rico is a territory that has a CDC arboviral laboratory. And so they've done extensive testing there, and they are on top of the situation. And um, I do think that there's been a lot of um, information provided to individuals in Puerto Rico. Uh, I was wondering if there's been any evidence of uh, the Zika virus being transmitted from females to males sexually. Um, we haven't identified that. Um, transmission route, but we're certainly still looking to see if that's possible. Um, there haven't been any studies that have been published, and I haven't heard um, anyone communicating information about um, the presence or of Zika virus in female excretions. 
Hey, I had two questions. The first one is, has it been determined at what point in pregnancy the fetus is most susceptible to Zika virus? Um, and two, how susceptible are these species of mosquitoes to something like getting sprayed with um, insecticide by a company like Mosquito Joe? I'm not an entomologist, so the last question may be um, difficult for me to give you a good answer. To, to my knowledge, they are not resistant to insecticides at this point, but I'm not sure if it's been studied. And um, that's just kind of my gut reaction, so not a very good answer for you. The other is it something that's actively being investigated, and that is are women during the earlier stages more at risk for um, poor fetal outcomes if they acquire infection during early stages of pregnancy? And the data suggests that they can acquire infection at any time during their pregnancy, and it can compromise the fetus. But there does seem to be more severe complications with women that become infected during the early stages of their pregnancy in the, um, eight, I think it's six to eight week range. Uh, you indicated that, that uh, there are antibodies that you can test uh, indirectly. Uh, so my question is, uh, can we look forward to a vaccine, do you think? Absolutely, and they're working very aggressively on that um, right now. And so it would be important for women that live in endemic areas to be vaccinated that are in the childbearing age. And so there is a lot of promising work that's currently being conducted, and I think we can expect to see a vaccine in, in the next year or two. One second. I'm getting some exercise. <laughs> from a public health point of view, should we be discouraging travel to and from these in these regions where it's rampant? Um, certainly discouraging travel for women in, that are pregnant. Um, that current um, recommendation is to not travel to regions where it is endemic. And um, also then the advice provided to abstain from unprotected sex to in males that have traveled to endemic um, regions and come back home. So um, yeah, travel advisories are in place. So uh, about that, like you, you think we can expect a, some sort of vaccine or something ultimately. Um, how do you think, so, you're not particularly, right before the program, I asked you about this, the fact that there have been cases in North Carolina and how scared should we be. And you didn't really th think that we had to worry about it that much, that like, you don't see this blossoming into a horrible epidemic. <laughs> <laughs> or do you? Uh, no. Let's, we can laugh it off. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to answer the question. It kind of puts me in a tough spot because, right. you know, certainly I could give you my opinion and I'll be wrong, right? which is embarrassing, but I could tell you what I currently think. Um, you know, if we compare it to West Nile virus, where we see, you know, birds being a reservoir and we can see transmission from birds into humans, Having human-human transmission alone really seems to be a barrier. And one of the ways, if you look at this, um, dengue has been at our border for many, you know, probably over 30 years, and we haven't seen it become an issue here in the United States. Chikagunya, too, it's at our border. We see it in some regions in the United States, but really hasn't become a threat. And Zika virus is the same way, human-to-human -human transmission, and um, this really may not become a threat to us here in North Carolina. Is there any particular virus that, what do you, what do you think is the most potentially problematic one out there? Like, you know, obviously, and, and recently, Ebola we've known about for decades, but then last year we got quite a scare. Um, is there any virus that you're particularly worried about? <laughs> Smallpox, someone said. 
Oh. We've eradicated that, and so in order for a smallpox outbreak to occur, it would have to be intentional and um, a terrorist incident occurring. I do, which is unfortunately a possibility, possibility. right? Yeah. Um, but um, we have developed strategies because it was thought um, that smallpox could be used as a weapon. And so we have a national resource that's called the Strategic National Stockpile. And so we have prepared smallpox vaccination so we could respond very quickly if um, smallpox were to be released. So I think we do have a degree of preparedness for that. Um, you know, it's hard to predict because viruses can change. But certainly influenza, if it, we have a dramatic change in the virus, which has happened in our past, that can certainly um, be devastating to us. We have developed strategies now. We have some therapeutics. We have vaccine technologies we can move to quickly. So even that threat, I think that we are more prepared than we have ever been for that virus. Um, Ebola, that's something that really doesn't keep me up at night. And um, you might find that to be surprising. But what we typically see with Ebola is um, small local outbreaks. And people are so sick, we typically don't see the explosion of infection like we saw in Africa recently. And even if you think about people coming into the United States, we did have some dangerous situations, but it was very well controlled. And so I do think we have a more prepared community. Um, but, you know, as funding becomes um, less and less abundant, I think we will become less and less prepared for something very unusual. You mentioned influ the flu, influenza, and that in the past, was was that part, like, in, is it 1919 that the really mm -hmm. bad one was? Was that something, it changed dramatically? Is that what you were, you, you made a comment. I mean, we um, deal with it seasonally every year, but sometimes it potentially is, it, is dra dis sometimes it makes a change that's so different that... Well, what's unique ab about um, influenza virus is that it has a segmented genome. And so what you can see, and influenza is also an example of zoonotic transmission. You hear swine flu and bird flu. Um, but what's interesting about swine flu is that pigs are susceptible to avian influenza and to human influenza. And so they're a mixing vesicle vesicle, they can become infected with more than one strain. And the strain that comes out of swine can be of recombination. And so it can be dramatically different from anything we've ever seen. So it's not that gradual change, but that segmented geno genome allows for reassortment that can come out with a virus that we have never seen. And what are the, why do we deal with the flu seasonally? Because it's always changing. <laughs> because not only do you have that reassortment, but you can also have small mutations that change the virus. And so what we do in public health is we do surveillance for influenza virus. We work with the World Health Organization to identify the circulating strains. And we look at strains during the beginning of a flu season and then the strain at the end of the flu season to see how it's changed over time. And that data and learning about other circulating strains on a global level allows us to develop new vaccines for what potential threats. But I guess why, why is there a flu season? Does it have something to do with the weather? Is, there, does, does it, does it, is it worse in a certain, like, why is there a season? <laughs> and it gets back to the indoor um, activity is, you know, in the fall and winter where Mm -hmm. mixed with individuals, usually indoors, and the flu is transmitted um, via the respiratory route. And so when you're together with people indoors, you're more apt to become infected. And then in the summer season, you spend more time outdoors, and respiratory transmission is a lot harder. Okay. And so you don't typically see flu. But you can see it in, in the summertime as well. 
Yeah, um, as far as the transmission goes, now I, I'm assuming the Zika virus is not transmitted on surfaces like some of the influenza and stuff. Um, I think my daughter supporting the uh, uh, hand sanitizer industry by herself for children. Uh, I mean, great and that's practice. The other, well, I, yeah, but the idea is, would that is that beneficial to Zika because it can be spread on surfaces by people that have it, or don't we know? I mean, okay. we haven't seen that mode of transmission occurring with Zika virus, and it predominantly is via the mosquito. That's the primary way it's transmitted. Well, Dee, this has been fantastic, and we've said a lot. What, uh, just to leave us, uh, what do you want us to leave here knowing? <laughs> Give us a, what are your, any parting uh, remarks, and how scared should we be? What, how precautious should we be? What do you want us to know? Um, well, I think my parting message would be, um, I hope that you have learned a little bit about the North Carolina State Laboratory of Public Health and our commitment to protecting the citizens in North Carolina. And we in public health are really here to support the well-being of citizens here in North Carolina. I think that um, Zika virus is a threat. I think it's important for people to be educated. And I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight because I think education is a powerful tool for a healthier society. And so I just thank you all for coming out to this enclosed <laughs> environment where we could spread viruses in, in intimacy. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. How about a nice round of applause? Keep it going. Dr. D. Pettit. And I know some of you might still have some questions and D you'll be around for a little while. So thank you very much for, for your great questions already. And next week is science trivia night and uh, the museum, this building is still open until nine o'clock. What? Oh, Greg Fishel Town Hall. That's next. That's two Thursdays from. Oh, that's also next Thursday. Right at the same. So we have a very special event along with trivia night. We have a town hall with Greg Fishel with a very special scientist guest uh, about uh, climate issues. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>